Hello and welcome to the latest episodes of Analyzing Anfield from the Liverpool Echo. I'm Beth Lindop. I'm joined by Kiefer MacDonald, a slightly different hosting lineup perhaps than you used to on this podcast. But we will do our best over the next few months to try and unpick all the tactical talking points and big news from inside Anfield uh, in what could well prove to be a very exciting few months for the club as well, Kiefer. Uh, now it is transfer deadline day. So on today's podcast, we will be assessing Liverpool's January transfer business or lack thereof um, and assessing and whether we think they've got enough to, to carry them till the end of the season. We'll also be looking at potential successes for Jurgen Klopp. Very big shoes to fill, I think we all agree. Uh, but before that, we have to start with Liverpool's 4-1 victory over Chelsea last night. I mean, Kiefer, they were just phenomenal, weren't they? Absolutely. I mean, I said after the game that I think we've been waiting for a, a kind of a statement performance from Liverpool for so long this season. You can maybe argue that they've done it kind of in halves or patches or final 30 minutes, whatnot. And maybe the Newcastle game on New Year's Day was as close as, we, as, close as we've had to kind of a, a complete performance. But last night, from, from minute one to, to minute 90, they were they're absolutely brilliant to a man. I mean, you know, Chelsea haven't had the, the best of seasons, but, you know, leading into the game, they've, they've found a bit of form, I think. You know, only four teams in the in the Premier League have taken more points from them uh, than them over the last six games. So, you know, they were quietly on the up on, on under Pochettino, um, and it's it's a squad that's you know let's not forget got two hundred million pound plus midfielders in Enzo Fernandez and Moises Caicedo, and and Liverpool just as I say to a man were absolutely brilliant. All the goals were were phenomenal. I mean, starting off with with Jota, he was he was just kind of summed up him and what he's how important he's been to Liverpool in, in recent it was a, months. It was a prime Diogo Jota goal, that, it wasn't was, it, last it night? It was really good. And, and Theo actually said to me at the game last night, it was kind of Suarez-esque mm-hmm. in terms of like a, a lucky deflection. But but then when that deflection does break, he, he kind of holds his nerve, waits for the goalkeeper to dive and, and kind of slots it home. And, and that really set the tempo for Liverpool after, what, 15, 20 minutes. And, and from there, Chelsea never really looked like, you know, testing Liverpool. I, I mean, I don't think Alisson had anything to do during the game. I mean, he might as well have been sat, sat on the cop <laughs> with, with the rest of the Liverpool supporters. But, I mean, considering the news that that Liverpool had last week, obviously the shock announcement that, that Klopp would be leaving. Um, I think it, it was a real tonic that last night, wasn't it? And it, I think it made everyone kind of buckle up and strap in for, for these next couple of months, which could prove, as you said, said at the top of the show, Beth, that, you know, uh, just they could be magical, couldn't they? A, a really good way to end his reign. But, I mean, obviously we'll, we'll touch on Conor Bradley. I don't know what you thought of, of his performance. I mean, if, as I say, so many good performers, but I think he was the, the pick of the bunch. He kind of had that, that fairy tale night at Anfield, didn't he? Yeah, he did. I, I was totally blown away, to be honest. I mean, I've been so impressed by him in, in recent weeks. He's He's been phenomenal. I think that's three Man of the Match awards he's, he's won over the past few weeks as well. And, you know, I think coming into this season, it, it sort of felt like he was going to be the, the Trent backup. And, you know, I, I've had my, my reservations at times about Liverpool's decision not to... to bolster the defensive ranks in the summer and obviously in January um, but with, with the emergence of Jarrell Quantzer and now the form that, that Bradley is, is showcasing you can understand can't you why why the manager and, and his staff have, have decided to put faith in, in Connor Bradley and just looking at some of his his stats here for, from last night I mean 63 touches one goal two assists four key passes three tackles um, a 9.4 sofa score rating and I know those ratings don't always you know, necessarily reflect how they perform on the pitch but last night he was he was just phenomenal and I think what what I loved about him there was a, a guy sat behind me in the main stand and at one point he said the thing I love about this kid is is he always wants the ball he's yeah. always asking for it and that's all you can ask for, for yeah. from a young player isn't it that confidence to be able to to just get on the ball and he knows exactly where to be he knows when to take risks but he also knows as well which I think is maybe something that he's learned a little bit in league one when to, to play it a little bit safe and yeah. I think there'll be a lot said about his, his attack um, his attacking play and, and how phenomenal he was going forward but also I think defensively he's no slouch either is he? No absolutely I mean you touched on it then of, of kind of how forward thinking he is and I think that was a takeaway from from Sunday's game against Norwich as well uh, I mean for, for Nunez's goal he dispossesses the, their left back on, on the halfway line who was really high up and, and he plays the ball straight away to, to Jota gets it back and then plays it straight through to Nunez and in a blink of an eye Liverpool had gone from defending you know their own half to, to going through on goal and it was kind of similar last night for, for the um, for Jota's goal, wasn't it? He obviously dispossesses um, Chilwell, you know, really high, high and wide, and then straight away he's driving into that that space, and and he makes a difference once again. And as you say, it's you, you know, I, I think prior to this season, everyone was looking and thinking who did Liverpool sign who could replace Trent Alexander Arnold. There was a lot of talk about you know if if, if Trent's position was in in the middle of the park. Um, but the, the biggest compliment I could give Conor Bradley is that he's making his own name. He's not he's not a, a Trent 2.0, so to speak. I, I mean, if anything, he reminds me more of Robertson, how he prefers to go on the outside. I mean, yeah. I think he's got a, a nicer touch than Robertson and a more delicate delivery. Um, and I think he's a more complete footballer than Robertson. Um, 
But I just think the, the potential for, for him and Trent on this right-hand side for the next couple of years is, is really exciting. And it's it's not come out of nowhere either, because as you say, the preseason tour, um, he really impressed on that. And I think the plan was to kind of maybe do this at the start of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, he was really unlucky with that back injury and, and kind of spent a, a few months on the sidelines. And, and he's just kind of come alive in this January period where Liverpool really needed him, especially with, with Trent getting getting injured. And, and all of a sudden, you're kind of laughing and joking now, saying, you know, what does Trent have to do to get back <laughs> into this team? So, I mean, it was a really good night for him, a really positive night. And, and so many... In the, in the Liverpool team played really well. I thought McAllister was another one who had a, you know, probably one of his best games since since joining the club. Um, kind of ironic that it was up against Caicedo, someone he he formed such a great partnership with, partnership with at Brighton last year, and obviously Enzo Fernandez, who he won the World Cup with in last year with with, uh, with Argentina. But I mean, he was brilliant to to kind of steal the show up against, as I say, two hundred million pounds worth of talent. Beth, I, I thought, you know brilliant from minute one to 90 wasn't he yeah and I did think sort of you know when you go back to that first game of the season you know Liverpool played it at Stamford Bridge I did think that you know McAllister in that holding role looked slightly shaky and you, you know you looked at um the quality of of, of Enzo Fernandez at, at that point I thought he was probably the standout player on that day and I think you know last night it, it was sort of um almost like a, a full circle moment playing Chelsea again and actually it was McAllister who who stole the show and he's just he's he's one of my favorite players to watch yeah. his his range of passing is is exquisite i mean that ball he plays through to Nunes for the assist then to uh, to, to Luis Diaz um, and he played one prior to that i think it was out to, to Cody Gakpo and just he's so smooth isn't he yeah. and and so intelligent i think you know I, I love watching intelligent footballers it's like that that's why everyone of a Liverpool persuasion loved Roberto Firmino so much wasn't it because his his IQ as as a football was was second to none. Cody Gakpo, I think, has got that too. But but Alexis McAllister um, is just a brilliant football brain, and that translates to to what he does he does on the pitch. And I think it, it will be interesting now to to see what Liverpool do in midfield because you know, as you say, we can all joke and say, well, where does Trent fit in? Um, but but really, where does he fit in? What 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 would you what would you do if you were Jurgen Klopp? <sighs> Well, thankfully, I'm not Jurgen Klopp, um, <laughs> but it's difficult, isn't it? Because we, we've seen Trent. Um, I don't think he's really started out and out in midfield too too many times this season, and certainly not in his his, uh, his Liverpool career. We've, we've mainly seen that with with England under Gareth Southgate. Um, but I think it has been interesting at times this season when Liverpool have been pushing for a winner or an equaliser, especially. You know, you think that Fulham game at the start of December when they were three two down and end up winning four three. That the kind of the catalyst for that final thirty minutes was was Trent going into midfield. Mm-hmm. I think Gomez comes on, um, and that's that kind of changed the dynamic of that game. And, and Liverpool kind of wrestled a, you know, a grip on the contest and and obviously ultimately you know got the, a massive three points. But it, Klopp's not really done it from the start, and I don't think he's, he's needed to yet um, because that kind of does feel, as I say, like his trump card if, if things aren't going Liverpool's way. Mm-hmm. But it certainly is, would be interesting to see him, you know, him and Bradley. Um, the, the one thing I, w- I would kind of query is, does it would it make Bradley's role? Um, because you look at like last night when he has the Bosley in front of him and he has a McAllister, you know, he has that kind of protection going the other way. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're kind of putting all the onus on Trent to be the kind of the creative nucleus of the team, um, and then you've got Bradley there who's kind of, you know, flying up and down the, the touchline, would you maybe have to rein in Bradley a little bit and just say, you know what, we've got Trent doing this, Um especially when you've got someone like Salah on that side as well. But I'm, I'm sure they can find kind of a happy medium where both of them can kind of really, kind of really flourish. Um, and it's so exciting because they're both so young. I think, what, Trent's 25 and, and Bradley's 20. And, you know, Bradley's, what, two Premier League appearances that's now. And, and as you say, he's got, I think, two man of the matches in those appearances. So a really exciting time, not just for Jurgen Klopp between now and the end of the season, but whoever does come in and, and kind of take the hot seat at Liverpool beyond because it is a really exciting team that, that Jurgen Klopp has kind of quietly reassembled uh, you know he says it a lot this season as he's a Liverpool 2.0 but it it really does feel like that and I think someone who is going to be key that I think we do have to touch on Beth is, is Darwin Nunes I mean I don't think I've done a Liverpool podcast over the last 18 months since he signed <laughs> where I haven't talked about Darwin Nunes so we'll continue that theme today I mean it was just a crazy night for him um I mean, I, I can't find the words to sum it up, really, but how did he not score is my first question to you. He is the unluckiest centre-forward in the history of football, I think, <laughs> isn't he, really? Um, and I do think if sort of any 90 minutes could encapsulate his Liverpool career so far, it was probably that last night, because I thought he was absolutely phenomenal for most of the first half, just such a nuisance. Um, had a couple of, of efforts on goal, decent efforts on goal, drew a, a really good save from, from Petrovic in that first half. Um, and it was all going so well 
until until the penalty and, and you know I, I did see obviously McAllister had the ball at first and I know Liverpool have been doing that for, for quite a while haven't they they've been sort of disguising the penalty taker protecting them Mo Salah quite often gets handed the ball right before he goes up to take the penalty and, and I do get that but I did think when I saw McAllister stood on the spot with the ball I hope he takes it because you know it just felt like unneeded pressure for Nunes if he was to yeah uh, of course it, he's you know I actually didn't realize until after last night that was the first penalty he's missed in his professional career I think he'd scored 12 out of 12 prior to that so that's an impressive record and you can understand you know why he was he was given the ball and you know you want your centre forward to to step up and take that responsibility don't you You don't want a, a number nine shirking away from from the responsibility of, of taking a penalty so uh, in, in a lot of ways I admire him from, for doing that but he is uh, in spite of his, his good record previously, I would not have him on, on pens going forward because he's such an emotional player. Yeah. Um, and, and I think he feels that weight of expectation on him, you know. Probably more than most. Yeah, so I, I think when you've got some ball strikers in the team that, that Liverpool have, you know, Dominic Zabozlai, Alexis McAllister, Trent Alexander-Arnold even, you know, it, when Mo Salah's not on the pitch, I wouldn't have Nunes taking the pens. Um, but yeah, I, th I thought sort of second half, he sort of dropped off, I think, the first sort of 20 minutes of that of that second half. Perhaps that, that penalty miss was, was lingering it in his head a little bit. He gets a bit of a petulant book in for stopping a, a quick free kick. Um, but then again, he, he rallied, and that's that again. That, that's why so many Liverpool fans love him because he doesn't let let things phase him for too long. He gets his head straight back up, and then an absolutely sublime assist, wasn't it, for, yeah. for Luis Diaz? It, it really, really was, and you could see from sort of how vehemently he, he celebrated after that. It was almost like he'd scored a goal himself, and and that's why you will him on because he, you know he, he just wants to do well, and, and as such, you want him to do well, but. I think that the thing is we're sort of waiting for him to, to come good almost. We're waiting for him to sort of have that run where he's banging in the goals, you know, every game and his game sort of becomes a little bit more polished. And, and actually last night I was thinking, I don't think we're ever really going to get that with him. You know, I know he's still relatively young, 20, 24. Yeah. So, you know, he's, he, but he's not a kid. Yeah. And, and I sort of think this is almost maybe what we're going to get from him. And there will be games where he, he spurns great opportunities, but there'll also be games where he's phenomenal. And I think more more often than not, he'll he'll play a huge part in Liverpool doing well. Um, and so I think ultimately we maybe have to sort of stop being so reactionary when he has a good run of form or when he has a bad run of form. I think that's the sort of player he's, he's going to be for Liverpool. Absolutely. I mean, I was reading a piece earlier, actually, and it, it kind of highlighted that you know, for kind of all the, the big misses that people have pointed out, he's actually probably won Liverpool more points than he's so-called, like, lost Liverpool. I mean, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're thinking of big misses, it's pr probably that one at Luton Town yeah. in the 1-1 where, you know, Salah has the header, I think it is, and then, you know, Nunes kind of um, yeah, skies it from, you know, four or five yards out. But apart from that, you think of, as I say, the, the kind of the big goals he scores. He scores the one at uh, Burnley over Christmas, the opener. He scores, obviously, the two at Newcastle earlier in the season. Um, and uh, I know I know what you mean. I mean, obviously, Liverpool paid a lot of money for him. And I, th I think if Klopp was staying in charge for a bit longer, you'd, you'd maybe have um, more kind of understanding in, in the project. Um, but I think if a new manager is going to come in and put in his, his, his ideas on the table, you've you really got to look at your, your number nine and, and think, you know, which way do I want to go? And, and to be fair, I think Liverpool, you know, despite him not getting on the score sheet last night, I think Liverpool are a much better team with him in it. Um, what I really like about the, the kind of front f four or five players at the moment is that each of them have something different. I mean, Jota was always a goal poacher, but he's kind of added m more to his all-round mm -hmm. play, I think, over the last 12, 18 months. Maybe almost kind of helped by that, that barren run he had last season. He's maybe learned to add different kind of aspects to his game. I think Luis Diaz, we've seen over the last kind of four, five, six weeks that he's adding, or well, he's looking more like the Luis Diaz that arrived at mm -hmm. Liverpool um, in January 2022. Um, I think Cody Gappo is a bit of a connector. He's a bit of the, the utility man, the, the James Milner off mm -hmm. the forward line, if you like. And then most salaries, most salaries, you, you, you're undroppable one, isn't he? But Nunes kind of is, is a bit, bit of a mix of them all, isn't he? He's, he's not obviously got the ruthless streak that most Mo Salah has. Um, but, I mean, the tenacity to, to kind of wrestle to Argo Silva, as you say, for, for that to, for Diaz's fourth goal last night. I mean, that's, as you say, everything you want to see from your centre forward. And I just, I just think if I was a centre half and you hear, like, you know, the likes of Carragher and Neville say it, like, you just wouldn't want to be playing against him no. because how do you, do, you, do you stand off him? Do you give him space to run at you? Do you go tight? Um, all right, you stand off him. He's, he's going to touch it down and, and bring it on the floor. He's capable of playing. Um, you know, he's good in the air. It feels like he has got, as as, we, as everyone has said for the last kind of two years, 18 months, two years, whatever, he has got, you know, 
if you could you know make a dream strike it almost you know height speed uh, physicality uh, it's just kind of the finishing and, and the, the clinical the, the clinical edge that he's lacking him at the moment yeah and but 22 goals and assists you know in all competitions so far this season i mean in january that's not a bad return no, at all really, really is good. it really it's gone under the radar somewhat, yeah hasn't it? and i think i think it's because it, I think that's where the frustration is born from sometimes because you think if he converted even half of the chances yeah. that he creates, then he'd be a you know twenty goal a season striker in the Premier League alone. Yeah. Um, and I think there there is a chance he gets to that, but like I say, I almost sort of think this is going to be him. I don't think he's ever going to quite be that polished diamond that that Erling Haaland is, for example. But um, still, as you as you say, hundred percent agree. I think he, Liverpool are far better. To, team when, when he's playing there as well. So. I like last night how he, I don't know if you noticed this, but within the first 10 or 15 minutes, he'd already had four or five shots. Yeah. It was very much a shoot on sight approach <laughs> because I think we've seen sometimes he does overthink it and I think mm. he does get into his own head. As you say, he's, he's an emotional striker, he's an emotional player. And uh, there's, there's been times that, you know, where he's won, won the ball and he's, he's, he's counter-pressed in a really good area and he's got someone on the edge of the box and he's got someone at the back post. So he kind of gets caught in two minds and he, mm -hmm. as I say, he doesn't really have that kind of ruthlessness to make a decision and stick to it or pick an area. And he gets dispossessed, he gets his pocket picked but last night, the, the 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 two kind of early shots he had, I think the first one, Petrovic chips onto the bar, the second one onto the post. It was just, you know, wins the ball back, um, you know, touch out his feet and strike. And I really did like that approach because it was kind of, I think that put Chelsea under an, an, an awful lot of pressure as well. And, and the, obviously Anfield really got behind Nunes straight away because it was like, oh my God, he's nearly scored. Mm -hmm. And it was like Nunes, Nunes, Nunes. And, and that, I think, you know, if you're a Chelsea player in the first 10 or 15 minutes at Anfield, I mean, you listen to anyone who's ever played there, they say you just got to survive, you know, mm -hmm. make it to half time and then you, you start looking at if you can nick a point or, you know, nick all three points kind of thing. But I think that really helped set the tone for, for Liverpool last night. Yeah, definitely. One other thing that I just wanted, wanted to touch on briefly from last night's game um, was the passing of, of Van Dijk and Canate because I think Liverpool has so much to admire about what they've done this season tactically and there's so much for for opposition to worry about in terms of the threat that Trent brings going into that sort of inverted fullback role and obviously then the wide players, Mo Salah, as we've touched on there, Darwin Nunes. But then when you think they, they, they can set up opposition teams to, to deal with that, and then you have the ability to bypass completely yeah. midfield with with Van Dijk and, and Canate with the, the quality of passing that they have. I mean, Van Dijk, that ball that he he played through to um to Connor Bradley to then set up Dominic Sabozlai for for the third goal and. Canate, he could have had about three assists, couldn't he, in the first half an hour? He, he's turned into sort of prime, prime Beckham, <laughs> spraying some balls, you know, left, right, and centre. So he, he, I thought it was really interesting last night because both of them showcased exactly what they bring from an offensive perspective as well as a defensive perspective last night. That's such a, a real asset to Liverpool, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, funny enough, I, I said the same to Theo last night. There was, um, I always think of that goal, um, I think the 21-22 season where against Burnley, where Van Dijk brings it out to Elliot. I think, uh, is it Mane who scores it? I think Liverpool win 2-0. Van Dijk out to, to Elliot on the right. Elliot plays it into Mane mm -hmm. and it, you know, Liverpool score it with ease. And it kind of always felt that that was Liverpool's you know, best way to bypass the press was, and it was Van Dijk's ability to just pick a pass out of nowhere. Um, and the reason I said it to Theo is because I actually thought that Joe Gomez is kind of passing has, has really come on mm. in, in recent re weeks and months. Obviously, he's playing this inverted fullback role. But, I mean, the three of them now, Canate... And to be fair, Quanta as well. So you can you can mention all four of the lads who can potentially play at centre half. I think their ball playing ability has, has really come on, and, and we've seen that they're they're really comfortable getting the ball on on the edge of their own box. You know, as I say, we've always known that Van Dijk has had that quality. He's he's probably been the best ball playing centre half probably the Premier League scene in the last 20 years, bar probably Rio Ferdinand. Um, but it kind of seems that like the other lads are, are really learning from him. And, and you know, when you have got a team like wait, Chelsea, who are, you know, last night where. You know they're trying to sit in and make it difficult, make it awkward. And as I say, you know you're playing away at Anfield. You're not you're not a great team. It's it's, it's a new Chelsea team, isn't it? Under a new manager, um, you know you're going to sit in and make it difficult to beat. And and that the, the element of those passes from as you say Canate and Van Dijk, it really gave Liverpool an out ball. And in the second half, when you know Chelsea would were, were just getting picked apart, weren't they? And as you say, Van Dijk pings it out to Bradley. Bradley takes a touch out his feet. I think he beats that Disassi and then whips in a, a wonderful ball for for Sabozla. And that, you know, it kind of just shows that Liverpool can do it all. They can they can score the intricate, you know, fine passing move goals where it's, you know, 30 passes, whatnot. They can score the counter-pressing goals where they win it high and wide. But they can also score the goals where it's, you know, almost like a, a glorified route one, if you want to call it that, mm. where it's, 
it's you know two or three passes and then the ball's in the back of the net so yeah that was a, another really pleasing aspect and as I say it's not just not just Canati and Van Dijk I think I think Gomez as well has, has been really strong in that department recently yeah just just finally on on last night's game then I'm going to give you a little a little test um so last night Connor Bradley was involved in three goals which means that in the history of the Premier League only two defenders now aged under the age of 21 have been directly involved in three goals in a game who was the other one Trent it was Watford indeed. Five, no. It was. Yeah. So I mean, that bodes very that bodes very well, doesn't it? That uh, that Liverpool have two defenders, two young defenders, capable of, of bending a game to the will in the way that those two are. Um, but we will move on now from from last night's game on to, to transfer deadline day. Obviously, not been a particularly busy month for Liverpool in terms of, of incomings. We've had a couple of players going out on loan. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Because I think before Christmas, I sort of would have liked Liverpool to sign a, a defender. I think again, what what kind of Bradley has done in the last few weeks and Jarrell Quanta as well has made me reconsider that a little yeah. bit but do you think Liverpool are well stocked enough to be able to maintain a, a quadruple charge in the second half of the season? Uh, I think without, without sounding like a cop out I think we'll only find out in, in, in obviously in the future won't we? I think the one that does worry me is the Europa League um, just because of the, the kind of the travel that comes with that and obviously the quick turnarounds you know, Thursday to Sunday and you know on the knockout rounds they, they come obviously thick and fast don't they? Um, but I was kind of similar to you. I think when the summer window closed, I was I thought Liverpool maybe kind of unnecessarily left themselves a bit short. We know they were looking at someone of like a Levi Colwell, and obviously when he committed to Chelsea, Liverpool didn't really pursue any other you know alternative targets, did they? And you know we were hearing all these great things about Gerard Quanser, and we saw him on the preseason tour. And as someone who's watched like you know a lot of academy football over recent years, I was always a big fan of his but I'm, I don't think anyone saw this kind of rise mm -hmm. coming in especially in the short term um, but I think because of how unexpected that was to the outside obviously we, we know that Klopp was was uh, Klopp, Peplin the, the whole kind of first team staff were, were really impressed by Connor Bradley by Kwanzaa they kind of had this quiet faith in them and I think maybe if it was a Champions League they would have looked at alternative targets but because it was the Europa League and, and they probably knew they'd win the group at Kanta with you know with minimal force it was just you know the recovery that probably would have been an issue um, I think they were probably happy to bed Kwanzaa in and, and give him that time and I think he's grown from strength to strength obviously we, we, we saw him play you know predominantly the, the home games in Europe and a few of the aways um, and then he's kind of transitioned into you know League Cup FA Cup and, and Premier League and he's, he's really held his own um, you know whether that be alongside Van Dijk alongside Joe Gomez alongside Ibrahim McInerney he's not someone that needs to be led. I think he's a, a leader. I mean, his, his debut was against Newcastle with Liverpool one 0 down. I mean, that just kind of just shows you everything that Jurgen Klopp thinks of him, and and he obviously can handle the occasion. Um, but I must say, yeah, back in September, I, I was a bit thinking unnecessarily short here. It could come back to bite us. Um, but now, I mean, you look at it, you think Liverpool have gone through the really testing December schedule. That was that was really ruthless, playing on you know three or four different fronts, and they had so many players come, uh, you know, out, out injured. Sir Bosley fell. What January was it? Trent at the start of January as well. Um, but now you're looking at it, and you think, well, Endo and Salah, you know, should be back in the next two or three weeks, depending on when he returns to full fitness. Obviously, Endo's in the, in the quarterfinals, I think, of the of the Asia Cup now. So, I think the final of that is the 11th of February. Um, so they are starting to get loads of players back. It feels like they've gone through that really testing period where the squad is going to be at its absolute most stretched kind of thing. Um, so in, in terms of today, transfer deadline day, which is just a normal Thursday, isn't it, for Liverpool now? Um, I'm not really too fussed that they're not bringing anyone in because I think that the squad is kind of flourishing nicely. We we spoke about Alexis McAllister at the, at the top of the show and I think he's another player who's, who's really grown into his own. And I don't think anyone predicted that he would be Liverpool starting number six, you know, when he was signed. You look at Wataro Endo and you, you look at the kind of reaction when, when he signed, everyone was very underwhelmed and, and surely this is a smokescreen. There'll be someone else to come through the door, but and there wasn't. And, and he has taken time and, it you know, similar to Fabinho when, when he first came in, but slowly and surely we've seen why Klopp had that trust in him and, and why Klopp said that everyone from the Bundesliga was, you know, congratulating him on he, you know, and Liverpool managed to secure a deal. So, I think now I think Liverpool are in a, in a good place. Obviously, as we've seen two or three years ago, you know, injuries can come out of nowhere, and all it takes is you know a, a torrid turn of luck, and, and all of a sudden you're on the back foot. But I don't think you can plan for a crisis like that. You just have to kind of, you know, deal with it head on. Um, but you know, I think Liverpool have got you know plenty, plenty in in, in depth wise. Um, you look at the League Cup final later this month. That obviously be your full strength eleven. Uh, but then after that, it's it's you know, obviously the FA Cup isn't the next round will be the the, the, the what was it the thirty then the sixth mm -hmm. so the quarterfinals is 
next not next but one after that um so it's kind of the business end of season where you're not looking to rotate as much you're probably looking to play bar in the europa league where you might throw Kwanzaa in kelleher in Mm -hmm. you know gakpo in um elliot in you're mainly looking at now it's going to be your first choice 12 or 13 lads who are going to be starting you know near enough every game between now and the end of the season because if Liverpool are going to you know go toe-to-toe with man city with arsenal and whoever else they may come up against in all these competitions they're going to have to field their best team um and and the, the beauty of that as well is what we have seen this season is even the lads who are maybe 14th or 15th choice are, are capable of making an impact at, at that level. You know, someone like Harvey Elliott, who maybe hasn't done enough to kind of start games, you know, when he, he maybe hasn't justified his starts and, and impressed as, as maybe people would think, but coming off the bench, he's been a real game changer for Liverpool. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I'm really happy with the kind of the state of Liverpool's squad. As I say, things can change, but I think for the meantime, they, they are they're as good as golden. Yeah, I think like you say, it's so difficult, isn't it? Because one or two injuries and all of a sudden then you start questioning, should we have brought someone in, should we not? But as you say, you can't have a raft of of world-class players sat on the bench just in case, can you? And there'll be people who argue that, you know, Manchester City in the past might have had that. But even them this season, they've had a pretty small squad to to operate with. So it it is difficult striking that balance. And I do think last night Liverpool's squad looked really strong when you consider that Mo Salah wasn't there, as you say, Endo wasn't there. Ryan Gravenberch doesn't make it onto the pitch. You only bring in, you bring in those four substitutes on with what half an hour to go, twenty minutes to go. Um, so I think they they are in the squad does look in, in pretty rude health at the moment, which is is really nice to see. And and who knows, they might have signed Mbappe during the time we've been doing this podcast. Absolutely. Well, I wouldn't hold my breath. But we have got <laughs> one question from Mickey. One more. He said, "Does Thiago feature in this team for the run in, or should Endo be given a continued run after the Asia Cup?" I mean, I think you know my feelings on Thiago Alcantara. I I absolutely adore him. I think he's a wonderful football and I think we all do to be fair I don't think anyone disputes that um, but you know he has I think his last Liverpool start was a year ago this weekend which mm-hmm. kind of tells you everything you need to know he hasn't played a game since April he was back in training last Friday so we could potentially see hopefully a return to, to the Liverpool squad in you know sometime this month and you know as Mickey says does he feature in your strongest at Liverpool 11? Um, I think in the near future no um, I'm sorry, I know that 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 must hurt because I know you are a big Tiago fan, and I am a big Tiago fan. I love him, and I think when he's he's at his best, um, then you know, just purely on paper, of course, he would make it into my strongest Liverpool eleven. But I think he's been out for such a long time. Um, the club have been very careful with him. Klopp said last week, even though he, he's back in training, he does need time. Um, so I can't see him being thrown in at the deep end um, in the in the next month or two. Certainly, you know, perhaps if he if he slowly builds up his minutes, then maybe by the end of March, April, um, he might be in a, a run of games where he's able to to sort of really make that that number six role his own for a little bit allows McAllister to go a little bit further forward but then you've got Bataro Renzo who before he went off to to Japan uh to, to international duty with Japan he, he was undroppable really wasn't yeah. he that the form that he was in so um I think in a way that's quite nice because I don't think there's the, the necessity for Tiago to be back and, and in that start in 11 uh, no pressure is no there. as much as there would have been earlier on in the season when yeah. McAllister was maybe struggling a little bit um probably depends on the opposition as well, doesn't it? I think Thiago's ability to, to pick a pass from deep and, and really sort of unlock defences is, is one of his greatest strengths, isn't it? So, you know, if you're up against a side that are maybe sitting deep and you need to, you, you're in, looking to, to break that deadlock, then perhaps that's when Thiago comes into yeah. into the lineup. I mean, I don't know what about you. Would you would you throw him in? No, I, I, I agree ready? with you. I think, you know, if, if, if you are going to sustain a challenge across all fronts, that, as I say, all the squad is going to be used. But I think, you know, if you're, if you're playing a game tomorrow, of, you know, not not say tomorrow, but in, in two or three weeks, maybe you wouldn't pick him. And I, I just don't think at the minute, as you say, you can afford to maybe him be a passenger for those early weeks. I mean, mm-hmm. he is a brilliant footballer, but the, the last thing you want to do is get so close and his body break that break down. Sorry, um, you know, it's kind of if I'm Jurgen Klopp, I'm similar to you. I'm, a, you know, I'm looking at the calendar and I'm probably circling five or six fixtures where I can maybe play mm-hmm. in between now and the end of the season. You, you're probably thinking of games at Old Trafford where you want to go toe to toe, where Liverpool, you know, historically struggled to keep the ball. If you kind of ignore the last couple of results there um you know we struggle to keep the ball and 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 and, you know maybe play play the occasion instead of actually playing the united team that's Mm -hmm. up against them i think tiago will be really good in a game like that i think we saw it a few years ago in the running where he had a similar obviously it wasn't as as long as of an absence but he he missed quite a lot of football over christmas with with this hip injury and he came back and i mean i always say that he was the reason Liverpool went within a whisker of you know a quadruple that it would have been that season um i always think that those two games against city the one at the etihad the two two Similar to Old Trafford, I think his 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 ball retention for Liverpool that day was was absolutely unbelievable. And then, 
I think two weeks later when they were, when they played City at Wembley and I mean Fabinho, Thiago and Cater I think started the afternoon and I still think it's probably the best 45 minutes mm. of, of the Jurgen Klopp era you know whatever is to come over the next four or five months but yeah it's, it's difficult isn't it it feels like previously there has been such a, a huge pressure and a huge weight on his shoulders because you know you look at the midfield he was coming into it was the likes of Oxley chamberlain who was unreliable himself fitness wise Cater too then you had Henderson who was clearly past his best and you had Milner who was a utility man but obviously being made you know being used more because of the injuries and then you kind of had Curtis Jones and Harvey Elliott who weren't quite fully fledged yet and they were kind of still learning their trade obviously Jones suffered with his own injuries so kind of felt like Thiago was your one man who you were just saying right he's fit he can put you know four or five passes together Mm -hmm. let's go out and and kind of wheel him out And, and that's kind of I think why his body broke down but between now and the end of the season, as you've touched on with McAllister, with Endo, the, the kind of the possibilities are, pardon the pun, Endo, <laughs> Endo aren't they? So um, I think if you can kind of find a happy medium and, and slot Thiago in there, I think it'll be a really nice balance. And, you know, if you are playing an FA Cup final or you need to win the, you know, you know Wolves at home on the final game of the season and whatnot, I mean, Thiago, I think, goes into your, to your best team. Yeah, definitely. And it would be lovely to see him play in this midfield, wouldn't it? With with Alexis McAllister, with Dominic Sabozlai, with Curtis Jones as well, playing in, in the way that he has been playing lately. Um, so fingers crossed that he will play some part, even if it's a small part, before the end of the season. Um, we'll move on now to uh, potential Jurgen Klopp replacements. As, as I said at the, at the top of the show, it's a really big job. Um, I don't envy whoever has to, whoever has to take it on. It, it still Jürgen doesn't. Klopp replacements does it it's, it, it's wild it, it is wild um and i'm not sure that there is someone out there who is is worthy almost of coming in and yeah. taking the job but someone will have to do it um my personal favorite i've got to say would be Xabi alonso mm. um and you know i know it is a it is a huge risk isn't it you know employing a a former player as manager we've seen you know what what frank lampard did at chelsea it didn't obviously quite work out for him there um even you know solskjaer at yeah. manchester united it was a bit of a an erratic period for, for the club during his time there so it is a risk and um, there's always a certain romanticism that comes with it um but i just think he, he's doing so well mm. um you know don't forget he's 28 games unbeaten in all competitions by leverkusen they're the, the only team in europe's top five leagues to have achieved that um the way that they're playing i think it's only bayern um, and stuttgart um, who have a higher XG, which I know, again, XG is one of those stats that some people love, some people hate, but it just showcases the, the type of football that he's got them playing, I think close to 60% possession on average as well. Um, so I think the style, even though it's a, he plays in sort of most of the time a 3-4-2-1, so a slightly different formation to maybe what Liverpool are used to, um, but that sort of the the way that he, he puts an emphasis on it and his wide players and, and pace out wide, which Liverpool have in abundance, I think could really suit them. And I also think that... You know the the charisma that he has as well, because um, I think replacing Jurgen Klopp in that sense is almost as difficult in, in the, the tactical yeah. sense. Um, I think he could be a good fit, and I, there was a quote the other day from from Leverkusen sporting director Simon Rolfs, um, and he said that Alonso had instilled a sense of seriousness and maturity in Leverkusen's football, and I think that bodes very well for him going forward as a manager because I think that's something that, that Jurgen Klopp has done and we've seen that evolution especially this season actually to go from a side that you know were maybe sort of this this heavy metal counter-attack inside to to now a side that does enjoy a lot of possession a side that does you know like to pass through midfield and have a, a maturity about them so I think that that's why I think Alonso could be a, a good fit. No absolutely I mean yeah, I mean, it's it's no going to be no easy feat, is it, for whoever does come in? And I, th- I think it's it's really difficult because when you think of someone who who replace who would replace Jurgen Klopp, you you won't assume it would be at the top of English football. You almost assume that Liverpool would need to be re you know they need another rebuild job. But mm-hmm. Klopp's almost done that job already, and that's kind of why he's leaving because of you know he said last week that. And the squad was in, in kind of capable hands and capable control that he didn't feel the need to take it on, you know, for the kind of the remaining two years of his contract, which is completely fair enough. Because I, I think, you know, if you buy into probably year two of the rebuild, um, then you've probably got to buy into years four, five, six, you know, and, and so on. So I think to leave now is, yes, why is it hurts? But I think if you strip it down and look at it at face value and kind of look at the rationale of his decision, I think it, it does make sense. In terms of Alonso, it's difficult because his sample size is so small. I mean, mm-hmm. he only took over Leverkusen in October 2022, wasn't it? So it's not even two years of management yet. But I think, as you say, Beth, the, the kind of the, the authority that he, he stamped on Leverkusen, I mean, this was a side that would, you know, I think they were in the relegation zone of the Bundesliga at the time and to kind of flip the club on its head. Um, I think they got to the Conference League uh, semi finals last year, sorry, the Europa League semi finals last year. Knocked out to Jose Mourinho's Roma, um, so no shame in, in losing to him in, in in that regard. But yeah, I mean, 
there's there's ways to to kind of impress, isn't there? And I think the style of football that he's playing is, is certainly what's caught the attentions kind of over here in England. He was obviously linked with the Tottenham job earlier in the summer before Poster Coglu. So it's not just Liverpool are, are looking at this former player and thinking, oh, you know, he understands the club. He might be a good manager. We'll chance it. You know, Tottenham, you know, obviously considered him. Um, and obviously that wasn't to be what, for whatever reasons. Um, but I... I, I, I I think that the two main ones are probably De Zerbi and Alonso. I think that at the moment, everyone's front runners, and there'll be other people, I'm sure, like the likes of Thomas Frank, who have done good jobs at Brentford. I've, I've seen his name floated about. Um, but I think if you were to, if you were a better man to put your money on, it'd be one of those. I think, as, as you say, Beth, I think someone who's going to get the buy-in from, from the crowd is, mm-hmm. is important because whilst this squad is young and it's shown you know, real signs of promise, you know, there's, every, there's every chance they could be starting next season as you know, FA Cup holders, League Cup holders, um, Premier League holders and you know going into the Champions League as Europa League winners, so there's enormous expectation on that. And, and with that, you know if you if you you know even go two or three games without a win, or you you only win four of your first ten, say you just go through a sticky patch. I think if you have someone like Deserbi who's obviously alien to Liverpool, he has no con- no connection, no buy-in, um, and that's not to say that Liverpool fans will turn on him instantly. I think they mm-hmm. would understand that. You know, that was kind of the early years of Klopp, wasn't it? You'd, you'd beat yeah. Ma- I always remember they beat Man City 4-1 at Anfield, you know, as recently as 2018, and then lost one of the Swansea the week after. So that was kind of the Jekyll and Hyde nature of it. But I think because you could see the bigger picture, he was, you know, infectious, char- charismatic, it's easy to buy into it. I just think with someone like De Zerbi, maybe you don't have that. But with Alonso, he's someone who understands the club. Obviously, he was adored by the cop, adored by Liverpool fans. Um, and I just think he he has that aura. I mean, this is a player who's won, you know, three or four Champions Leagues. He's won the World Cup. He's, while he, okay, he might not have the, the, the biggest um, kind of managerial CV and he probably hasn't got the experience that De he's had working up, you know, through the leagues in Italy. I think as as kind of a young player, you know, you look at the, the kind of squad, you know, the ages of, you know, 18 to 24, they all know what, what Alonso was as a player. They'll all respect him. I'm, I'm sure the likes of Harvey and Curtis Jones will have idolised him at some point mm-hmm. during you know their their time as Liverpool supporters. So I think that in its own kind of commands its own respect and brings its own authority. And I, I, as you say, th- those comments from the the sporting director there and kind of how he goes about his business and, and kind of the image he, he, he kind of has at the club, I think that tells you everything. But from a tactical point of view, it, it will be a different style to what Liverpool are used to. Um, I think it was a three four two one. You said that yeah. they to play. So obviously Liverpool haven't played a back three since the back end of Brendan Rodgers' time, which um, you know the days of Emre Chan and, and those kind of players, Colo Torre, Martin Skirtle. So it would be a completely different different blueprint, I suppose. With that, you know, if it's a three or a five, whatever you want to call it, there is obviously huge emphasis on you know wing backs, full backs. So you you know we talked about Conor Bradley, mm-hmm. we talked about uh, Trent Alexander Arnold, we talked about. Um, Andy Robertson, and you've got Costa Simicus as well. So you've you've got a, a, a real kind of excellence of, of fullbacks there, whatever the occasion. You throw Joe Gomez in as a as a makeshift fullback as well. You've kind of got um, fullbacks for any occasion. You know the the Premier League kind of may present. Um, stylistically, I, I don't know if it would be. I mean, I mean, I know Jurgen Klopp's kind of adapted f- throughout his Liverpool career, as you say. When he first came in, it was a bit kind of erratic, heavy metal mm-hmm. football, chaos, organised chaos probably is a, is a kind of term. Um, obviously, over the years, I, th- I think they've, especially the 1920 season was the f- first year I really noticed that they were a bit more controlled, a mm-hmm. bit more composed, you know, a bit more happy to, or happier to, to receive, to have a lion's share of the possession rather than, as you say, playing on the counter-attack with, you know, flying, you know, Salah and Mane. Um, I do wonder if this Alonso ball may be a bit slower, a bit more, you know, build up from deep, similar to De Zerbi, really. Um, yes, you're looking to press in high areas, but it is all about, you know, splitting the fullbacks and kind of playing with, with your six, bouncing it off your six and then moving up. Um, I've, from from kind of the videos and clips I've seen of, of Alonso's Leverkusen this season, as you say, it's, it is um, overloads with, with um, you know, fullbacks pushing up high. I mean, they've got Jeremy Frimpong there at the minute and they've got Hincapia, who has been linked with Liverpool as, as well in the past. Um, so they have got, you know, really good players to do those roles. It's just whether you could implement something like that and, and go for such a change at Liverpool after kind of what they've been used to. But I think whoever does come in, it's going to be a huge change to, to, to what Klopp has been playing because I think Klopp's philosophy is, is is representative of his personality and I think you'll find that with most managers. So, you know, it's not going to be another Jurgen Klopp and I don't think we should try and look for another Jurgen Klopp. No. I think maybe, you know, the next manager that comes in should be, you know, Shabby Alonso, you know, his own yeah. his own version of himself. He, he shouldn't try and play to, to, to what he he thinks people want him to be or, or what he should be and that may be ripping up the blueprint and saying right you know I've got this young squad they're young enough to be moulded um, you know this is going to be my way I'm going to define a generation in, in the same way Klopp did so I certainly don't think his, his, his play style 
well, as, as I say, I don't think his play style is kind of suited to this Liverpool squad at the minute, but that's not to say it couldn't work. Yeah, and I think, of course, you know, we say there he, he, his Leverkusen side, side tends to, to be a 3 4 2 1, but that's not to say that he's going to, you know, follow that, that mould at Liverpool. You know, it's all about the players that you have at your, your disposal, isn't it? And I think uh, one thing about Alonso that, you know, from, from reading a little bit is that he's not massively married to sort of one mm. stylistic philosophy. And uh, I saw a quote that he values winning above all else. Uh, which I think would go down very well at Liverpool um, and you know so perhaps you know when he, he sees the players that he, he does have at Anfield if indeed he does he does come here then he might you know alter alter that formation he might not particularly stick with with the, the 3 4 2 one. I suppose it's a different kettle of fish isn't it playing with Liverpool you know that, as I say there's every chance they go into this having won every competition this season um, you know it's completely different to playing against Leverkusen who I know have had their kind of financial problems um, you know when you're trying to compete against the likes of you know Bayern Munich, Borussia Dortmund, RB Leipzig so it's, it's certainly he'd be, he'd be with one of the heavyweights of the league rather than looking to kind of punch up with the plucky underdog so mm-hmm. as you say that could completely change his, his style. Yeah I mean we've touched a little bit on De Zerbi. Um I mean I was, I was reading something that Pep Guardiola said about him not too long ago. Um, his teams play Michelin star football and he's one of the most influential coaches in the last 20 years. Now, I do always think Pep hams it up a little bit when he's, and he's talking about an opponent. Um, but high praise indeed. And there obviously is some truth in that. And he was, you know, earlier in the season, I think, you know, the way, the way Brighton got through the Europa League group, um, obviously the first time playing in Europe. So it, that was an incredible feat last season. There was so much to admire about them. I think Liverpool bore the brunt of a couple of their best performances of the season um, but they were obviously on the receiving end of a 4-0 defeat at Luton Town um, earlier in the week now of course you can have bad days at the office and, and they have had it's worth worth noting a pretty bad injury crisis of late um, but they have actually only won three of the last 16 games I mean is that the form of a Liverpool manager? It's not and I saw that stat do the, the round the other night it's actually I, I wasn't aware of the, the wider context to it. Um, yeah, I knew they hadn't been on, on a great one of form, I think. It was only one win in five prior to prior to um, the game against Luton. I didn't realise how, how disastrous the run was because I think they've, they've done really well in the Europa League. They had a tough group. I think they had Ajax, Marseille and um, another Greek side, I can't remember. But, you know, they, they qualified out of that group automatically. So they got the bye into the, to the round of, of 32. Um so there, there, there is a lot of kind of caveats to Brighton's performance this season. You also factor in that they've lost McAllister, they've lost Caicedo, you know, they've lost the goalkeeper Sanchez to Chelsea. And then obviously if you extend it further back, you know, who Brighton have lost over the last two or three years, it's a club constantly in transition. So mm-hmm. I feel as a manager, it would be quite hard to, yes, you've got to take the rough, rough with the smooth, but it feels like it would be quite hard to, to kind of plan it and almost build a legacy at that club. And I'm sure, you know, he'll have ideas and plans to do that. I mean, you touched on it there last season. He qualified them to Europe for the first time in FA Cup semi-final defeat to United. So, you know, it was certainly if you look at how the season started, losing Graham Potter so early and you recovered it. I mean, his first game was that 3-3 at Anfield, which was, I don't think anyone knew much about De Zerby prior to that. Um, and then he came came and really announced himself to the, to the Premier League. Um, they are obviously eighth at the moment, so they're not as punching as high as they were last season. But as I say, there's, there's loads of caveats to that. Um, yeah, I mean, stylistically, again, De Zerbi's another one who likes to play from deeper. I think there's a lot of emphasis on, on the centre half and uh, kind of just reading a few things from kind of Brighton websites and, and people who you know watch watch Brighton far more often than I do. And it's De Zerbi does this thing with his centre half where he basically encourages them to put their foot on the ball, which is it's to kind of compare it to like futsal and, and what you do in that kind of game to to kind of entice the opposition and then into pressing and then he just looks to bypass that with you know passing between the lines breaking the lines and, and breaking quickly and that's, that's where they have something that you feel like could suit the, the personnel yeah. that Liverpool have yeah, especially it? you think the, the front line I mean they, they've got Matoma and, and Pedro up there they've, you know, they've got Solly Marsh and, and those kind of players but they've got quick players and they've got players who can you know break um, you know, really fast in transition, and, and Liverpool have got that. You know, maybe Salah isn't as, as fast as he once was, but he's, he's certainly no slouch. And <laughs> obviously, got Luis Diaz, they've got Diogo Chota, so they have got players who can kind of go back to front. And I think we saw that last night. I mean, look at Conor Bradley's goal with uh, I think Diaz, uh, Jota wins it, and then I think it goes back to Luis Diaz, and he plays it through to Bradley. I mean, I'm sure that came from a Chelsea turnover in possession, so it's it's kind of going back to front like that when when Chelsea have 
not Chelsea, but a team have, have committed players high high and wide up the field. But I think everyone now, I mean, we've got a few comments in here saying that, you know, people are, are favouring Alonso and he's the only real candidate. Um, someone says, I like Deserbi, he doesn't have a good squad at Brighton. With our players, he could possibly do the business. I mean, that's that's an interesting point. As I say, Brighton are always in transition. They probably always know that they're, they're, they're probably the bottom of the, 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 the food chain at mm-hmm. the Premier League at the minute. And all eyes are kind of on them because of how they've recruited and, and people are, you know, looking to snap up their, their next pro- prospects. Again, he certainly wouldn't have that at Liverpool. He would be, you know, at the top of the food chain. But I think the the, the pleasing thing with De Zerbi that I, I do like, and it's it's similar to Klopp, which I, I can't comment on whether Alonso has done it extensively. He probably hasn't had enough time to, but you look at the, the players De Zerbi's worked with and he's always improved him. So you look at Shakhtar, his big one was Mudrik, mm-hmm. and he ends up going to, to Chelsea for 60, 70 million quid last, last January. Um, and a lot, of, I mean, I know Chelsea probably massively overpaid for him, but a lot of that was was down to the time that, that they kind of had at, at Shakhtar, um, obviously before the the, the kind of conflict uh, with, with with Russia and that league got halted. But he was kind of a real bright spark. I remember there was one game in particular at the Bernabeu. Um, I, I can't remember if they drew or they they lost last minute, but Mudrik got a standing ovation. So that kind of shows that the levels he was able to reach under Deserbi. And then you've got players like Trossard, who okay they didn't have a a, a, a real long stay on Deserbi, but they improved. He got a move to Arsenal. Then you look at McAllister. He spoke glowingly of him recently, um, and then Caicedo as well. So there's, there's players that Deserbi has, has kind of followed with the Brighton model, where he's bought for cheap and, and turned them over. And I just think when you when you when you look at the the kind of constraints that Liverpool work under sometimes under Fenway Sports Group, you know they can't go you know pound for pound with Manchester City in the transfer market. It is sometimes about taking a step back and looking at maybe the second rate market and mm-hmm. thinking, you know, can we get a Ryan Gravenberch for 25 million? Can we then transfer transform him into say a 60, 70 million pound midfielder? And I think De Zerbi, his, his track record so far would suggest he can do that. So I think that's a massive tick in his box. But I think it then goes back to the whole kind of loving with Alonso. I think that is <laughs> kind of, I know, you know football, you shouldn't mix football and emotion at times and you should try and separate the two, but it is kind of quite hard to, to overlook. Alonso, isn't it there? Yeah, I, I do. That, like I say, I do think he is the the outstanding candidate for the job. Even though Deserbi does probably have a, a bigger body of, well, he definitely does have a big bod- bigger body of work to look at. Um, I think that's a really good point actually about Mudrick because I think you know he, he obviously missed an absolute sitter last night, didn't he? But um, there, there was a reason that that Chelsea paid so highly for him. There's a reason that Arsenal win, were in for him, and that's because of his form at Shakhtar and Deserbi played a huge part in that. So um, credit to him for that. I think that the way that he he plays, obviously again that that sort of high pressing, the emphasis on on quick passing, on overload in the opposition box, all of those things that you can sort of associate with the Jurgen Klopp team, really. You know, they've, they've played, his Brighton side have played 4-3-3 quite a lot as well, which again is perhaps positionally more suited to, to Liverpool than, than what Alonso can bring. Um, so I think there's a lot of positives to take um, from, from De Zerbi and certainly until I heard that start, that slightly concerning start yeah. about the 3-16 and 16 wins. But I think there's always context and stuff like that. And yeah. I think especially when you... You know, people like us who don't follow Brighton as closely as, as we would say a Liverpool. I think it's it's quite easy sometimes to get caught up in that and look at it maybe just as for what it is without you know contextualising it and, and maybe looking at how well Brighton have done in the Europa League or what they've kind of had to balance with with this season. Yeah, I, I do think that the one concern with taking a manager from Brighton and Brighton get a lot of praise and rightly so for what they do in the transfer market in terms of bringing players in. And I think for for players that come in there I think sometimes it gets levelled at clubs like Liverpool and Manchester City and Chelsea why don't they take more risks in the same way that Brighton do but I think when you play for a club like Liverpool there's a certain expectation that you come in and you, you do the business straight away and if you have a couple of bad games then that's you out of the starting lineup. I think at Brighton it's it's a different story because you know we hear all of the, these names of players that they've bought for not a lot of money Caicedo obviously prime example who go on and then become these sort of £100 million pound players but there's also probably with in their ranks a number of players who've come in for, for not an awful yeah. lot of money who who maybe haven't delivered or take a little bit of time to deliver and and would they get that time at Liverpool and I think from a managerial standpoint it's probably the same thing you know that sort of form three wins in 16 would just not fly at Liverpool no. so um, that is my, my one concern but another contender just finally um, is uh, from Sporting Ruben yes. Amarim um, so just give us a little bit of a, of a rundown on him and on why he's been linked with the job well, I mean his, his kind of career today is, is really interesting so he's He's only actually currently 39. He's, he's managing sport in Lisbon. Um, and, and basically before the pandemic, Sporting were really kind of strapped for cash. And um, 
Ruben Am- Am- Amorin had been a coach for 10 weeks at, uh, at Braga. And just before the pandemic, so in March 2020, uh, Sporting paid £10 million, um, a, re- a release clause to, um, to Braga to, to bring uh, um, Amorin to the club. And it was a really strange decision at the time. I was, I was reading kind of some articles from that period and they were all saying, you know, Sporting don't have money for players. You know, they're a selling team. Why are they spending so much on a manager who's who's had, you know, five, six, seven, eight weeks experience? But essentially, you know, the, the, the following season after, after that, he, uh, he ends Sporting's 19-year wait for a league title. Um, and funny enough, actually, the job before he was at Braga, he didn't even have the correct coaching uh, qualifications. <laughs> so the, the, the team that were in the third division... Um, had a six point deduction um so i think it was suspended in the end um because kind of similar to the lad at remis at the minute will still um he wasn't qualified to, to kind of coach these games um so in he left and then he goes to braga then he goes to sport in lisbon um and since then he, he's just done miracles he's um he plays a 3-4-3 three, three, um and funny enough at the heart of his defense is sebastian Coates, so a former liverpool defender um but he's done really well in europe um and as i say he, he won the league title so he's another one who has been tentatively linked I, i'm not sure um how strong those links are um but i think tottenham were linked with him in the summer one um after the conte era um it, it feels maybe like someone is waiting for someone in kind of a, a bigger European league to take a risk on him mm-hmm. and then maybe so I, I don't know if Liverpool will be his next job but maybe it feels like someone in Spain should take a risk on him first and then you know you maybe look at him going to the Premier League or you know if De Zerbi goes does he go to a Brighton or or someone like that somewhere you, you maybe can play around with it a bit but he certainly has the he's, he's a similar age to obviously Alonso so it's a really interesting one he's, he doesn't have a huge body of work but from from reading about him and, and, and watching a few videos he his uh, his pedigree of what he's done so far is, is is really interesting yeah I think experience wise like you say it's probably a similar ilk to, to Alonso isn't it and I think that's the reason I'd be more inclined to take that risk on Alonso is because of his relationship with Liverpool because I just think that will automatically buy you buy you a little bit more time and maybe command a little bit more respect in terms of players that you're able to attract to the club because we know how many players come out and say that Jurgen Klopp was the reason that they came to Liverpool so you want someone of a of a similar standing I guess within the game to be able to to attract players is to the club um but i suppose only time will tell um before all of that though we do have a, a the small matter of a, of a league title uh, a quadruple perhaps to be won um so yeah over the over the next few weeks some some really big games and we'll be back in it in a couple of weeks time to, to I think is, is the plan isn't it so. yeah so we'll be back in a couple of weeks time to to dissect obviously we've we'll got the arsenal game this weekend some other big games coming up as well um, but thank you very much for listening to, to analyzing anfield